this problem asks us to find uh, the electric field everywhere outside and inside a thin shell with uniform charge with charge uniformly distributed along it. Uh, so let me let me draw the situation here. It's a very thin shell. We, we'll just ignore the thickness of the shell and let's assume it has some charge. It doesn't have to be positive. Let's make it positive. And that has some charge Q. The shell has radius capital R and we want to find the electric field everywhere outside and inside the shell. Well let's divide it up into two read. Call it R1 and R2 where R1 is less than the radius of the sphere and R2 is greater than the surface of the sphere. Well the way we would have to do this is we would have to, maybe if I draw it, the axis right here, I'll find some point out here and I'll say the electric field is equal to the integral of Coulomb's constant times dq over the, the distance away, uh, let's say r2 for now, we're some distance greater than the, the, the radius of the shell. So we have to find the expression dq, so I'll say that's k whatever the uh, linear charge density is along that shell, or I guess I should say surface charge density is, so that's sigma dA over R2, and this should be squared, and I don't know what the surface charge density is, so I'll say that's k q over A evaluated over dA R2 squared, and you see as you move along the shell, dA is every little differential area element is changing um, and your distance to the point is changing. This is a really complicated integral. Um, it, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I, I keep doing this. E is the integral of dE. So we don't want to do that. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use Gauss's law. That will make our life much easier. So if this is, let's say, I'm, I'm going to make this a little shorter. So for R2 greater than the radius of the shell, I'm going to make this little Gaussian surface. Now remember, what I've drawn here is a two-dimensional depiction of a three-dimensional surface. So as the problem states, this is a shell of charge. It's a spherical shell. It's hollow inside, but on the outside, charge is uni uniformly distributed around it. Well, I'm going to make this Gaussian surface at some radius, let's just call it R2, greater than the radius of the shell. This is an imaginary surface. It's a Gaussian surface and that is imaginary. In other words, it's not exactly there, it's just a tool that I'm using. So this, there is this imaginary Gaussian surface um, and so we'll also employ Gauss's law that says the flux through the Gaussian surface, I'm adding the little subscript, GS. You don't always have to do that. I just add that so you remember that we're talking about the flux through the Gaussian surface, not the flux through the shell or anything. The flux through the Gaussian surface, by definition of flux, is the surface integral of the electric field, and the dot product of the electric field, and all the little differential area elements. And, and that's the definition of flux that finish out Gauss's law says that's equal to the charge enclosed over the constant epsilon naught. Where epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, just saying it just describes how well the electric field travels through this medium without, in, the, in, in, in uh, for free space it doesn't become attenuated at all, but if this were electric field traveling through water, the water would respond to the electric field because water is, consists of polar molecules and so, so you have a different effect there. We're always going to be talking about free space for, for the most part. So let's start looking at this 
this uh, integral right here. If I look at kind of magnified, um, let's magnify this portion of the shell. So I'm just taking a magnified view of that portion of the shell. So it's a very thin shell, it has positive charge. The shell is an area and it's defined by differential area elements, very, very small elements of the area dA. And that element is always perpendicular to the surface. Now if we back up and review just a little bit, if you have some, let's say it's just a, a flat surface. Oh, why did I draw? I drew a cube, not a not a surface. Well, okay, we'll look at a surface on the cube. So I can de describe this surface here by the area vector a, which is just the magnitude of the area, you know, length times width, times what we call the unit normal vector, which means that it's just the direction normal to the surface, perpendicular to the surface. Here I have a curved surface, so I can't do it this easily, but what I can do is break it down into little segments, dA, of magnitude a in the direction of the unit normal vect vector, but, but that's not even proper to say because the, the, the size of this differential area element is infinitesimally small. It's almost infinity. It's so small that this little piece of surface, uh, of surface is essentially flat. And therefore, the vector is directed perpendicular to that flat surface. So let us also look at the electric field. Well, the electric field, we know if all this point, this, this positive charge is, is lined up here, the electric field is going to point radially out, right? I mean, we kind of have a feel for this because, of course, if we take a tiny section dq, there's going to be a, you know, electric field radially pointing out everywhere, but if we take the electric portion of the electric field right next to it, it's also going to have the same thing, and everything is going to cancel everything out except that which is completely perpendicular to that surface, E. So since dA is always perpendicular to the surface, and E is always perpendicular to the surface, then this integral just becomes the integral of EDA. If we remember uh, properties of dot products, A dot B equals AB cosine of theta. It's the projection of A onto B times B. And in our case, theta is always equal to zero, so then it's just AB. Well, the same thing down here. Theta is always equal to zero. I mean, I could put go ahead and put the cosine term in here, but theta is zero always, all the way around the surface. So I'm just, okay, so, um, so that goes to one. So E dA equals charge enclosed over epsilon naught. I should note that I did draw these dA differential area elements coming out of the, the sphere, the charged shell, but since we're drawing our Gaussian sphere to match that symmetry, they're going to be in the same orientation, pointing radially outward. I shouldn't have connected it to the charged sphere. I should have connected it just to the Gaussian surface. But you see, the, they're in the same direction either way. Also, we note that E equals constant at fixed radius. So there's no reason that you know x oh, you know x distance away from the charged shell here, the electric field should be anywhere anything different than x distance away over here. The electric field is exactly the same everywhere around. So because of that, E comes out of the integral. And we can integrate this to say E A equals charge enclosed over epsilon naught. 
Now, I want to note that we're talked about up here about fluxes through the Gaussian surface. So I might want to go back and add these subscripts, Gaussian surface, Gaussian surface, Gaussian surface, Gaussian surface, to indicate that we're talking about the area of the Gaussian surface. Just like this is the charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface. It seems like a trivial point here, but with other problems, this is, this is a, an important deviation or important thing to keep straight. So what is the charge enclosed? Well, since R is greater than the radius of the charge sphere, charge enclosed is just equal to the total charge on the sphere because this is the charge uh, shell and this is our Gaussian surface out there, this Gaussian shell around it. So the charge enclosed is the entire charge. And the area of the Gaussian surface is just 4 pi r squared, which is just the area of a, of a, of a, the surface area of a, a sphere or a shell. And this is r2 again. So e times 4 pi r2 squared equals total charge over epsilon naught. Well, I can solve for the electric field by saying this is 1 over 4 pi r2 squared times q. Uh, capital Q over epsilon naught, but I'll just move the epsilon naught over here and the R2 over there, so E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over R2 squared. What is this? This is Coulomb's constant, so E equals K Q over R2 squared. What that tells us is that the electric field outside of the charge shell is the same as if all that charge were on a point charge in the center. We, tr we model them exactly the same, which may seem intuitive or it may not, um, you know, because this is very different geometry than just a point charge, but outside of that shell, doesn't matter, it takes the same form. So I'm going to go back and just squeeze in right here for R1 less than R. It's the same exact thing. The flux through the Gaussian surface. Now we've got a little Gaussian surface inside of the charged shell. But this one's really easy because according to Gauss's law, which is charge enclosed over epsilon naught, what is the charge enclosed? That equals zero because all of the charge exists outside of the Gaussian shell that we drew inside. So that means the flux through the Gaussian surface equals zero. So that means E dot dA equals zero. The area of the shell is not zero, it's, it's non-zero. dA, the integral of dA does not equal zero, so E must equal zero.